Hello everyone and welcome to part 3 of our deep dive into the details of Zack Snyder's Justice League. This time we get to talk about The Flash, the origin of Cyborg, both of their dads, and take a little field trip to Atlantis. In the last chapter we ended with a question. Where are the other members of the Justice League? And in chapter 3 we begin with our answer. We get our first glance into the life of Barry Allen, or The Flash. The establishing shot of the sign of Central City immediately told the fans which character we were about to meet, which was really exciting. The sign next to that saying, reduce speed ahead, is also pretty ironic given the fact that we're about to be introduced to The Flash, the fastest man alive. It's also funny that The Flash, with all of his super speed, would be late to a job interview. On top of that, the job he is interviewing for is to be a dog walker, which was unexpected. He is picking up odd jobs and side jobs and not really pursuing a full career and making the most of his potential, which he will talk to his dad about later. I like that we get to see Barry's life in action here before he discusses it with his father in that later scene. The show don't tell approach to introducing his character is really at play here. I think the best thing about this scene is how our first introduction to Barry Allen immediately shows us his sense of humor and personality. Ezra Miller is hilarious in this scene, and I'm not even going to list specific lines because it's really all of it. His fast-talking antics are really amusing, and he is lovable as the good kid who is trying hard but stumbling all over himself and incredibly awkward. We cut between Barry's job interview a man in the truck from our opening shot who is trying to grab a burger from the floorboard, and Iris West, who clearly has a romantic spark with Barry as they lock eyes and they share a moment together. The man in the truck slams into Iris's car, and in an incredible sequence, Barry turns so fast that his shoes literally disintegrate while the bottoms remain on the floor. He breaks through the glass effortlessly with a touch of his finger, and blue electricity bolts around him as he slides through a world standing still. His perspective is so fast that the world seems to have ceased moving at all. There is such a beauty to this sequence. Certain shots in particular are just a sight to see, and Song to the Siren, which is being sung in the background, is equally beautiful. The shot that looks through the broken window is my favorite. Aquaman and Lois have each had their emotional, slow-motion, musical moment for us to enter their inner world and understand their feelings, and now we get that moment for Barry. As Iris hangs in the air, he turns to grab a hot dog, which is silly and funny. He sweetly catches her in the air and slowly, gently lays her on the ground, looking adoringly down at her. There is a sweet intimacy to this moment. The song itself, Song to the Siren, is from Tim Buckley's album Star Sailor, and it portrays a sailor who sees a siren singing to try to lure him into the depths. In a movie really into mythology, it is cool to have a song using a mythological creature like a siren as part of its song choices, and one can see a prominent example of the sirens in myths like the Odyssey, which is a Greek epic poem by Homer. In that story, the hero and king, Odysseus, is traveling home from the Trojan War in a journey that ends up taking 10 years and the lives of much of his crew, as they face a multitude of unexpected trials and foes on their journey home. One of these trials is when their ship sails past the island of the Sirens, whose sweet songs make the sailors want to plunge into the depths to be with them, where they'll ultimately drown. The crew uses beeswax in their ears to avoid the temptation, but Odysseus wanted to hear the song, so he was tied to the mast to keep him from jumping in after them. Juxtaposed with the visuals of this scene in Justice League, I think the context of the lyrics of Song to the Siren take on a sweeter meaning. They say, Long afloat on shipless oceans, I did all my best to smile, till your singing eyes and fingers drew me lovingly to your isle. And you sang, sail to me, sail to me, let me enfold you. Here I am, here I am, waiting to hold you. When Barry sees Iris, he is immediately and magnetically drawn to her. He is not in the best place in his life, and perhaps is struggling to smile in general as he tries to just keep afloat and keep living the best he can. His big moment with Iris is when their eyes meet for the first time, which certainly fits the song's line about your singing eyes and fingers drawing me to your loving isle. 
As the song sings, here I am waiting to hold you. He is holding her and wishing to stay that way, I'm sure. Barry is with her in this moment, but as soon as the world which is stopped in time begins to move again, the moment will be gone and he will have to leave her side. There is a longing in the song and a longing in Barry's desire to be close to her, and you truly feel that. It adds an emotional weight and potency to the scene that I think is really cool. Once again, the song has a meaning unto itself, but the lyrics take on a new meaning in the context of the scene, and that is a dynamic that's really interesting. Also, I feel like when it comes to Snyderisms, this shot of the sesame seed flying in slow motion will be talked about for quite some time. The next couple sequences move pretty quickly from scene to scene. First, the sequence of Atlanteans being mercilessly dragged out of the ocean and thrown onto the beach by parademons make them seem really scary and merciless, and it's a tonal shift from the humor of the Flash. The size difference between Steppenwolf and everyone else also becomes apparent here, because next to this Atlantean, he seems huge. I admire the Atlantean's desire to do the right thing and protect the location of the mother box. Unfortunately, he doesn't get much of a choice because of the spider probe that essentially violates his mind and projects it. I think this is a neat touch because of the technology at Steppenwolf's disposal. He wields an axe, which is an older style weapon from our point of view, but he is an alien and utilizes advanced alien technology. Even his method of teleportation, the boom tube, is based in tech as we discussed in part two. The mother boxes themselves look like a sorcery or magic, but they are actually just pieces of technology so advanced it is hard to fathom them. It makes sense that his method of information extraction would be through a similar piece of mind invading tech. Lois's role in the film is limited, but I actually find all of her scenes to be quite moving. Hearing the Man of Steel Superman theme as she looks through pictures and Clark's belongings all the while wearing the engagement ring that he gave her is touching and sad. The light and shadow work here also evoke the feeling of dreariness and weight. Seeing these glimpses into her life without Superman throughout the movie will help sow seeds that give the ultimate reuniting of Lois with her love a real weight later on in the film. We then cut to Bruce and Diana who are discussing the team members they need to recruit, and there is some nice humor and banter between them. I like the personal touch of Diana discussing the war of the Amazons and the Atlanteans. Diana is always so loving and trusting as a character, and to see her doubt Aquaman because of his Atlantean blood is interesting to see. The prejudices from the sins of the past seep through for a moment, and Bruce has to remind her that she needs to stay open if they're going to unite a team, before accidentally touching hands with her. The film hardly spends much time dwelling on a romance between Bruce and Diana, but it definitely hints to their chemistry, and moments like this make me wish I could see their relationship grow in future Justice League films. My favorite part about it is that Bruce takes forever to recover from this accidental handhold. He keeps clearing his throat and is flustered by their accidental hand encounter as he introduces the next person to recruit. Next, we transition into what almost becomes a little short film about Cyborg. We hear pensive, dark piano notes in the score as we see Victor broodingly look through the window and see little kids playing football, which brings him back to his own time as a star player for Gotham City University's football team. We saw one of GCU's football games in BVS, so it's cool to see it return in this form. Here, Victor is not a haunted cyborg, he is just a normal person focused on his game. He is actually the quarterback and captain of the football team. The sequences of Victor playing football in the snow are like the sequences of Aquaman heading to Atlantis. They are gorgeous to look at, to the point of being iconic. When I think of a Zack Snyder shot, this is where my mind will go. This musical sequence doesn't have lyrics like many of the other characters have had, but I feel this achieves a similar effect. This is Victor's unforgettable moment to shine. The way this game is filmed makes it feel monumental, as if the world were revolving around the outcome of this football game. Hulkenberg's score is dramatic, intense, and triumphant. The combination of the music and the visuals leave this scene feeling every bit as dramatic as any of the world-ending fight scenes. There are five seconds left on the clock as Victor leaps in slow motion, slams into his opponents, and charges to the touchdown. You get a sense of his perseverance and his drive. He pushes to the very end and overcomes so many obstacles to win. As he wins the nail-biter of a game, he is cheered on by the crowd and celebrated. We see his mom's support before slowly descending to the empty chair next to her. The score and the tone slowly darken from a moment of emotional catharsis and triumph to a moment of emotional turmoil. 
we knew up to this point that Victor's father created the cyborg, and that he was the heart of Cyborg's story somehow, but we didn't know what the wedge in their relationship exactly was. Here we get the full backstory of their rocky relationship. No matter how many people are cheering in the stands, Victor's win now feels hollow. He wants and needs the support of his dad, who is absent and too busy with his work to focus on his son. Victor's mom tries to explain to him how Silas cares, but has difficulty showing it because he has so much work to do. Victor doesn't want to give him any credit, and feels like she is making excuses for his continual absence. His feelings have clearly been hurt, and his words reflect this. He begins to cry as his mom assures him that Silas and her are both proud of him. It's not often in superhero cinema that our heroes are shown crying, and I love the vulnerability of this moment. The gravity of this storyline is solidified here, because the performance makes me really care about this relationship and how it is affecting him. He isn't lashing out in anger, he's just hurt and sad and confused. I think part of him probably feels unwanted, or that his dad doesn't care because Victor's not being prioritized. Silas's actions have not presented him as a father that is super involved in Victor's life up to this point, and the praise and encouragement and presence of a father is so important to a child, especially to a son, and that vacuum leaves a lot of emotional turmoil and questions. The car wreck that is about to ensue is the literal inception of the cyborg. Because of this wreck, he has to be put back together. But Silas is the one who ultimately creates the cyborg and does put him back together. So to have Silas and Victor's relationship be the point of dramatic tension in the story works really well. There is a sad irony, but also a hope to the final line before the crash. Victor's mom says, With everything I know you can do today, I can't wait to see what you're going to be tomorrow. We know as an audience that what he will be tomorrow is the cyborg. He will grow and become something greater, a true hero. But first, there is tragedy. It was so sad to see Victor cling to life, staring blankly and breathing through a tube. Joe Morton gives a powerful performance as Silas, who is crying over the body of his son, and who has just lost his wife. This is the meaning of the chapter title, Beloved Mother, Beloved Son. This section is a bit of a detour from the main plot of the movie, but I do find it to be a very compelling story in its own right. I can't imagine what I would do if my son were in the same position, and it is truly tragic to see him powerlessly looking upon his dying child. One can imagine the regrets he might have had wishing he could have seen his son's last game or spent more time with his wife, who's also gone. All the things he never got to say because he was too busy. I think this is a reminder for all of us to make the most of the time we have and to be there for the people around us, especially our families, now, because we never know what life will bring. His son was more important than his job, and now his son is leaving the world. However, as we all know, Silas is not completely powerless. He takes it upon himself to keep his son from dying, and he uses the mother box to do it. I like that we don't cut back to him creating Victor in the lab, but instead transition back into Victor and Silas talking to one another in the present day. I like that it doesn't show the entirety of his origin here, but gives us the first piece. We have seen glimpses of the birth of Cyborg from the clip in Lex's files that Bruce and Diana watch earlier, so we can logically follow the story without going into all of it here, and we are also able to save the flow of the movie a little bit as we cut back to the modern day. Cyborg will explain the rest in a later chapter. One quick note I have about the clip from Lex's files is how different tonally it is from the other character reveals, and how tragic it is in comparison. The Flash in his clip stops a robbery, Aquaman just kinda looks cool, and Diana has the photo from her past. But Cyborg has a video of him screaming as his body is reassembled in a storm of lightning. It looks extraordinarily painful. It sets us up for how different Cyborg's story is going to be. So back to where we are in the movie. Victor stands with his back to the camera with his hood up, completely engulfed in shadow. He is hiding from the world and wallowing in darkness. Silas tries to encourage him to take his second chance on life, as his mother would have wanted, but invoking her name draws ire from Cyborg, who is not only dealing with his new alien lease on life, but also has recently lost his mother. In his pain, he spitefully tells his father how she would be alive if he had come to the game. There's no guarantee of that, but one can understand his pain and his sense of bitterness. He is extremely cold in his manner. 
The grudge he holds against his father, first for his absence and now for the death of his mother and his current predicament, sets us up for a powerful story of forgiveness, love, and sacrifice to come. Silas leaves a tape recorder with words he has recorded for Victor and says to listen to it even if he can't stand to look at him. He also solidifies the idea of second chances and forgiveness as he says, you don't have to give me a second chance, but give yourself one. As we discussed in part one, Justice League is about rebirth, resurrection, and renewal, and Cyborg's story is full of that. Not only has Cyborg just been brought back to life, literally, but his relationship with his father is dead as well. At this point in the story, more has died within Victor than merely his body, and there is much within him to be redeemed and restored. Snyder's portrayal of Cyborg is focused on his humanity, which is special, but also the way he is portrayed ups the ante in the mechanical component of his character as well. First off, his red eye is shown reflecting off the recorder, which reminds us of his cyborg nature. The sound design as he moves is so alien and robotic. It once again draws to mind the sound effects used in Bay's Transformers movies, and it is also pretty loud in the mix, which draws your attention to it. When he grabs the tape recorder, he lunges for it with brutal speed and accuracy in a way that does not appear at all human. It shows the cyborg nature in him in a compelling way, but also makes sense emotionally as he is hesitant to pick up the recorder and does so against his emotional judgment to resent his father. Curiosity gets the better of him and he decides to give it a listen. I also want to mention that the score effectively adds to the tension of this moment as well. Before he decides to pick up the recorder, the score has these rhythmic noises that almost evoke a clock ticking, which adds to the suspense as he considers what he will do. In the past, Holkenberg has collaborated with Hans Zimmer, including on the Batman v Superman score, and Hans Zimmer uses this technique a lot, especially in films like Dunkirk, so it was cool to see him use that ticking clock effect here. Silas's tape becomes our voiceover, as we hear of Victor's new abilities and see him try them out on a Gotham rooftop. I think it is telling that Silas's first words are not necessarily as a father, but more as a scientist, trying to orient him to his new reality. He is trying to help him the best he can, and Victor probably would not have listened had he been sentimental up front. But it is interesting that his message would begin with Victor's powers. Victor on the rooftop at night looks like a shot out of a Batman film, and that is really cool. This is Gotham after all, so the sound of police sirens and a beautiful full moon hanging over dark skyscrapers that look like they're out of a comic panel is exactly what I want to see. This scene of Cyborg testing his flight capabilities definitely draws Iron Man to mind, but the tone of the moment is quite different and the score is characteristically dark. It has an ominous quality, but also a slow build that feels like we're pushing the limits. With each phrase, the emotion pushes further and further, and in the scene, Victor is pushing himself further and further to see what he can do. Exploring his powers is not seen as something that's fun as much as it is a dramatic test and a rite of passage. Victor has become almost too powerful, and I think that that is where the ominous quality really lends itself. Cyborg is essentially being told that he is the god of the digital world in a sense. Silas says, in the worlds of ones and zeros, you are the master, we are all at your mercy. However he chooses to use these powers will have a monumental and possibly catastrophic effect. Our world is increasingly digital in nature, and were he to be selfish, he could cause global systems to collapse. If our lives are controlled and dominated by the digital world, then Victor in a sense can control and dominate the people however he wills. I think this kind of dilemma is perfect for the DC Universe and reflects characters like Superman and the questions raised in BVS. If there are beings of incredible godlike power on Earth, how do we cope with that as people? How do the beings themselves use that power? And when they make mistakes, what is the resulting damage, which is inflicted in proportion to the power they hold? A fight with Superman levels buildings. An evil cyborg could break the government, financial, corporate systems of the world, spy on anyone, turn people's devices against them, steal their identities, and any number of other things. Silas says the fate of the world will literally rest in your hands. What a weight and responsibility that would be. A great burden, but full of possibility. Holographic projections stem out of his forehead, which is another new interesting power. As Victor stares forward with a cold, dark expression, he analyzes the innumerable possibilities which we can see in the projections. We then zoom through his eye past lights and metal and into his mental world. The way the buildings fold into being in this digital aesthetic bring the Matrix to mind. 
I love that in the Mindscape, Cyborg is in his GCU jacket. He's not Cyborg, he is just the true Victor in his normal state. As Silas speaks of the world in his hands, Victor looks at his palm, as if to wonder what his hands are now capable of. In the distance, there is a gold ring in the sky that looks really interesting as well. The scene continues to build in intensity as the score continues to ramp up, and we see the embodiment of Silas' words. He speaks of nuclear weapons, and we see Victor hurl an army of warheads. He speaks of the economy as we see a giant metal bull and bear duke it out before Victor. These symbols are certainly representative of bear and bull markets. According to Investopedia, a bull market is a market that is on the rise and where the economy is sound, while a bear market exists in an economy that is receding, where most stocks are declining in value. Victor reaches out his hands and casts the bull and bear aside effortlessly. I like how this scene slowly builds and continually returns to Victor trying to fly and hover. As he finally begins to rocket heavenward with his eyes looking to the sky, the music crescendos in beautiful fashion. I love the cyborg theme and I love the music in this whole sequence. The visuals as well are moving and effective. A helmet forms around his face and he soars up past the clouds and the moon in a moment of true catharsis. That shot is movie magic. As he reaches the peak of his flight, he begins the final stretch of his mental journey, through the doors of a Greek temple. Inside is truly the greatest challenge and greatest temptation for Cyborg. Inside, digital stacks of money float in the air in a way that looks like a city. Silas articulates what I have been trying to say up to this point. The greatest temptation will not be what to do, but what not to do, and the consequences that could happen if he chooses to do something, because of the powers that he holds. He could easily knock down the dominoes of the world without a second thought, but how he decides to use this power is the burden that will define him as a hero and as a person. With great power comes great responsibility, as Uncle Ben would say, but this level of power adds an extra weight to the moral dilemma. I think this warning shows that Silas is truly looking out for his son and cares about his well-being. His advice about the burden of this responsibility is important, and it's sound counsel, honestly. Next we see this dilemma in action in a way that parallels a short clip I didn't really cover earlier during the football game. In that scene, we heard about how Victor had gotten in trouble for hacking into the school system and changing his friend's grades. Victor has a self-satisfied smile on his face that indicates he doesn't regret his decision. It is ironic that he would hack into a system given that he will ultimately become Cyborg, who can hack into anything. His mom assures the Dean that he only did this because he has a good heart. The friend was going through a tough personal time that would have impended her ability to do well in school, while the school wouldn't take responsibility to help her themselves. In ethical terms, Victor has essentially used the ends to justify his means. He has, in the name of things that he values, like helping people, sacrificed other values such as justice and fairness. He's done something ethically wrong, but in the name of a result that is good. Victor has the temptation to use that kind of thinking yet again, but now that his powers have increased, the potential risks from that kind of thinking have increased as well. He had good intentions for wanting to help his friend, and it is possible that the school had failed her. However, he went outside of the rules and the more righteous path by cheating to help her. This train of logic becomes a slippery slope pretty quickly, and I think that we see that slope begin to take place in this next scene. Victor has just been offered a choice. Will you use your unlimited power to do good, even if it risks great harm? Will you use it for evil, selfish reasons? Or will you decide not to use it at all, and keep the scales of the world undisturbed? He chooses to once again use false means to do what on the surface is a good deed. A good-hearted, hard-working woman with children struggles financially and has been forced from her home. It is a devastating story. We see a small stack of money that is representative of her assets. Cyborg increases her stack and gives her more. This is a troubling moment that surely defines the ethical dilemma. All of us at home watching sympathize with this woman, just as Cyborg does. We want her to have a home and to be taken care of and to be able to take care of her kids. Seeing her joy as she wins the money at the ATM that Cyborg has rigged for her is a moment that is moving emotionally. Especially after seeing how good a person she is, it feels right to us that she would be taken care of in this way. 
Even scripturally, taking care of the poor is extremely important. In Proverbs, it says, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. Similarly, in Matthew, it says, the king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. The difference here is that Cyborg is not giving something that is his to give. In his effort to help this woman, he isn't being generous and serving from his own heart and his own possessions and his own resources. He's actually stealing. Money doesn't simply appear in thin air out of Cyborg's hands. That money must have been reallocated from somewhere else. Cyborg is essentially stealing and redistributing wealth as he sees fit. This can also be seen by the symbolism of the temple that he is standing in. In economic terms, there is a thing called temple or palace economy, where wealth is funneled through a central authority, the palace or the government, and then redistributed to the people as that authority saw the most beneficial to society. The term originated in the study of the palaces of the Minoan or Mycenaean civilizations, which resided on Crete and mainly in Greece. With that in mind, it makes sense why this scene of Cyborg redistributing the wealth of society is inside of a temple of Greek design, because of temple economics, which comes from Greece. My intent here is not to say that the government or society should not help this woman. I believe that we should have a social fabric that takes care of these kinds of people, and as a Christian, my heart breaks for her and her situation. However, clearly the story is making some commentary that should make us question whether Victor is doing the right thing. Right after hearing Silas describe Victor's godlike control of the economic scales, and whether he would have the self-control to refrain from using it, Victor does not have that self-control. He uses it to steal from some and give to others without considering all of the ramifications. We aren't told where the wealth was redistributed from, whether it was from many people or few, whether they were rich or poor. Ethically, those factors shouldn't even matter. What is certain is that this is not generosity from Cyborg's own means to this woman. This is Cyborg becoming like a king or a pharaoh and reallocating the money of others with a move of his hand. The society hasn't appointed him to have this authority either. There are no checks and balances to his power beyond his own self-discipline. As satisfying as it is to see this woman be given to, Victor has a lot of growing to do to learn how to love and give and help people in a way that comes out of himself and not at the expense of what is good and just. The ends here are good, but the means are not, and the means are just as important, which the film seems to be doing a lot of questioning about. Next, Silas decides to go personal. He decides to speak from his heart as a dad, not just as a scientist and observer. I like here how the sound switches from non-diegetic sound, Silas is recording as a voiceover in the movie, to diegetic, in-world sound, as we see Victor holding up the tape recorder and listening to it. The sound quality of Silas's voice changes as it re-enters the world of the scene we are in. When Silas uses the word father, Victor crushes the tape recorder into pieces. His expression remains dark. A parademon appears at his window seeking out the box, and before it flies away, we see Victor with his arm turned into a gun, holding the box to protect it. I like that there isn't a big scene explaining that his body can weaponize. It is just one of the many things he is capable of at this point. He does, however, look down at his arm, possibly in surprise that it is transformed into a gun, which can indicate to the audience that this was maybe not a conscious decision, but instinct and self-preservation that brought it out. When he felt cornered, his cyborg body brought out the weapons needed to protect himself. This foreshadows something that will happen later. Another nice detail is the reaction of the Gotham citizenry to the parademon flying through the air. We get a glimpse here that the larger-than-life things that are happening to our heroes are in the same world as the citizenry and the normal people of Gotham. Right after our moments with Victor and his dad, we have a moment with Barry and his dad. If you hadn't guessed, the relationship between a father and a son is extremely important in this movie. Barry's dad is played by Billy Crudup, who also was Dr. Manhattan in Snyder's Watchmen film. And this exchange between them sows the seeds for Flash's character arc across the film. Barry's dad, Henry Allen, feels like his son is stalling in place instead of making something of himself, and he blames himself as a dad for it. 
We get some exposition as Barry mentions that his dad is in prison for killing Barry's mother, which he is innocent of, and Barry wants to pursue a criminal justice degree to get justice for his father and others like him. To Henry, this is all further evidence of how he is dragging Barry down, and because of this, he wants Barry to give up on him and his criminal justice pursuits. I think the emotional beats of this scene work really well. First of all, Henry and Barry matching their hands across the glass shows the love in their relationship. And secondly, Barry's response to his father's plea to sever the relationship is so in character. His face twitches as he tries to process it, and he tries to brush past it as a fleeting statement that should never be said again. Henry won't let it go though. He wants Barry to live life to the fullest instead of wasting it on his behalf. To him, Barry wasting his life is a greater injustice than his own imprisonment. He says an important line that will come back later about Barry's immense potential. He looks at his son and sees him as brilliant, the absolute best of the best. There is a tragic false dichotomy here, where Henry believes that for his son to reach his potential, Henry himself must be forgotten. In reality, his influence and encouragement as a father is vital to Barry, but the injustice of his imprisonment has led to Barry making life choices that are perhaps not in the interest of his long-term future, as much as they are the result of his desire to free his father and prove everyone wrong about his family. Henry clearly means the world to Barry, and though he is trying to push him away, Barry is at the forefront of Henry's concerns as well. Henry is dragged away as their 10 minute time together elapses. It is also interesting how many references there are to time and running in relation to the Flash. Henry says Barry is running in place and wonders how he has the time for all of these jobs, and those kinds of phrases seem to fit in nicely with a conversation about the fastest runner alive. The last thing we hear Henry say is that Barry is living in the past, and that he should make his own future. Once again, this will become vital to the culmination of Barry's arc, and Barry even repeats it to himself here, trying to get this new charge he has been called to into his head. I also find it interesting that in Cyborg's story arc, Silas is trying to reconnect with his son, while parallel to that, Henry Allen is trying to distance himself from his child, both in the name of trying to see their children reach their full potential. Following Barry's talk with his father, he returns to his hideout, which resides behind railroad tracks and fences, in a place that appears locked and abandoned on the surface. Inside, when the electrical panel is turned on, there is actually a hidden superhero lair, with computer monitors and, surprisingly to Barry, Bruce Wayne. I like how Barry's first comment is not about why the billionaire Bruce Wayne is in his hidden place, but rather why a stranger would be in, quote, his second favorite chair. That detail further fleshes out the kind of obsessive quality of this Barry Allen that I think adds to the personality of the character. He will eventually work for a crime lab, and his relentless ability to observe will help him there, but in the meantime, he almost seems to be taking in the world faster than he can process it, leading him to coming off as brilliant, but awkward, and sometimes socially inept. This recruitment scene is the opposite of the Aquaman recruitment in so many ways, which makes it stand out in a great way. Instead of resisting, he accepts Bruce's offer with enthusiasm, without even hearing his full, self-serious pitch to save the world, which surprises Bruce in a way I find amusing. Bruce is like, really? Okay then. <laughs> in addition, Barry tries to deny his superhero origins, much like Aquaman. But unlike Aquaman, he does not have a leg to stand on. His increasingly silly excuses for why he would literally have a Flash costume certainly got me laughing. Bruce throws a batarang in slow-mo, and in this instance, the slow motion is being utilized so we can share Barry's perspective. He grabs the batarang in midair and contemplates the situation in what for Bruce is a matter of seconds. The sound design of the world slowing down and the batarang slicing through the air really sell this moment. Lightning once again dances around Barry as the world seems to slow to a halt. The depth perspective is also worth mentioning here. Bruce is in the far background, and when Barry goes to reach for the Batarang, it almost feels like it was designed for 3D. The way he reaches for it, almost popping out of the screen towards the camera, is weirdly three-dimensional and cool. I also love how the score varies depending on which character we are with. Cyborg's music is string-heavy and melancholic. Barry's theme in the final act is epic and triumphant, but here in his computer-filled lair, the music has a techie quality with percussion and bleeps and bloops. Aquaman's music utilizes a lot of brass, which makes sense given that brass often represents royalty. In the comedy between Barry and Bruce, Bruce is the straight man, which works really well. 
Bruce tries to go through his whole end of the world spiel, which he has done in complete seriousness up to this point. But here, it's comic foil to contrast with Barry, who is way too excited for what's going on. He joins the fight not really because he wants to fight evil as much as the fact that he needs friends. Unity is an important theme within the film, and that unity happens when there is a strong community with strong bonds of friendship and family. Bruce, Diana, Barry, Victor, and Arthur are all loners up to this point, so them coming together as a family is giving them more than a team to fight with. It is giving them part of the necessary social fabric to live a fulfilled life. It will grow and change them to have friends and close relationships. Barry is smart to realize that and jump on this opportunity. I love every time The Flash geeks out about Batman, first about wanting to keep his batarang, and later about the bat signal. He also, in his humorous ramblings about snacks, gives the audience some information about the Speed Force that will be helpful later. Barry's speed comes from his connection to the Speed Force, which as he says is a layer of dimensional reality that manipulates space and time. And this is our first indication towards the possibility of time travel within the scope of Barry's powers. Once again, I love how Bruce gets to tap into his more comedic side when talking to Barry. Next, there is a short sequence of how cool Bruce's custom Mercedes looks, which definitely goes into commercial-esque territory like Bruce's razor earlier. It looks extremely stylish. As he drives off, he passes a billboard for AFSP, or the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, which says you are not alone. This works in three ways. First, narratively, Barry is no longer alone. He has joined a team and a community. It fits with the themes of the movie, which are about coming together. Secondly, You Are Not Alone is actually the message of the AFSP, which is a real organization, and this website is a legitimate site. Snyder lost his daughter to suicide, and in addition to the film being dedicated to her, this billboard in the film is representing a cause that is dear to the director's heart. He wants people to get the help they need, has championed this organization and cause, and was probably proud to put them in the film. Thirdly, because of Snyder's desire to support this organization, the Snyder Cut fans have contributed to it and supported it as well. There were a lot of fundraisers that the community helped raise money for, and the AFSP actually responded in February with these words. Thank you to the hashtag Release the Snyder Cut movement for their dedication to raising awareness and funds for suicide prevention. We at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention appreciate this remarkable community's ongoing partnership and its commitment to sharing life-saving education through their network. The hashtag Release the Snyder Cut movement has created a true community of support and their encouraging messages of hope will go a long way toward helping others know that they are not alone. We are honored to be a part of this movement and are grateful for all they are doing to save lives. It is cool to see a fan community actually contribute positively to the community at large, and the issues that are actually important. To rally around the value of real human lives and the effort to prevent their tragic loss, beyond their mere efforts for films or beyond any fan toxicity that exists. For once, we got to see a fan community do something powerful and kind. Under Snyder's leadership, the movement was able to be about this cause just as much as it was about releasing this kind of Justice League. The community showed their power to affect change in the fact that the Snyder Cut even exists as well. Their cry was heard after years of being told that this cut would never see the light of day, if it existed at all. And it is crazy to think we live in a world where this video is even possible. They paid to have billboards and messages showcased in various places, including billboards in Times Square. I think the billboards shown in this film can remind us of all of that journey that led us here. In our next scene, we get an exchange between two characters that I have never craved to see together, but I am now extremely happy to have seen, Diana and Alfred. Diana is much more put together and under control than Bruce, who would probably fall apart completely without Alfred. And I found it really amusing watching Alfred be unable to resist critiquing Diana's tea-making technique. He is a perfectionist who has made plenty of tea in his day and knows exactly how his proper way of doing it is. We also get to see a different side of Alfred get fleshed out. Alfred the Gadget Maker. In the Dark Knight trilogy, Alfred was more of the father figure, and Lucius Fox took care of Batman's tech needs, much like Q does for James Bond. But in this film, Alfred and Fox's roles have been kind of merged. Alfred has always been on the intercoms with Bruce and helped with some of his technology and the Batplane in Snyder's movies, but here we see him giddy as a schoolboy with a Kryptonian gun showing off the new blaster-absorbing armor gauntlets that he has been working on for Bruce, and it was quite entertaining. 
His laugh as the tech succeeds, how proud he is of it, and how much fun he has shooting the gun is wonderful. This also foreshadows that Bruce will soon be using this energy dissipating armor in our final fight. Diana makes a similar joke to the Lego Batman movie when she suggests Batman make his own lasso, but in his characteristic black color scheme. We briefly see Alfred's tea skills in action, as he once again can't resist serving others and pours Diana's tea for her. Next, Cyborg hacks into her monitor and gives her a meeting place. I like how Victor initiates the meet and confronts it head on, but seemingly not because he genuinely wants to listen, but more because he is demanding answers to why he is being pursued. He puts up a defensive wall emotionally and lashes out with his words. He looks scary, and his face remains shadowed and grim. As he approaches, the street darkens ominously. He tries to say how much he knows about Diana, almost to demonstrate his power and instill fear in her. He is clearly scared of being a monster and sees himself as one, but to cope with that he puts up this front that makes him really seem like a monster. He scorns the world and claims to have no interest in saving it. He denies that his powers could be anything but a curse, and he denies that he needs anyone else in his life after what has happened. He is lying to himself and to Diana, because as we all know, true healing happens in fellowship with others. It even says in the book of James, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Healing, growth, maturation, and strength, they happen in the context of relationships. We need each other. I appreciate how soft and genuine Diana is with him, despite how bitterly he responds to her request. She knows that he needs their support as much as they need his, and she wants the best for him. The people like her that invest in our lives even when we put up barriers and struggle to open up can truly change the world. Just like Bruce speaks life over Arthur that he cares and that he will step into what he has always been meant to do as a hero and how he shares his testimony of fighting with Superman, Diana shares her own testimony to Victor about losing someone she loved, Steve Trevor, and how long it took her to open up her heart to people again after believing the same lies that Victor does and shutting herself off. When we're hurt, our tendency is to isolate and hold bitterness inside ourselves, but all we're doing is hurting ourselves further and keeping ourselves from being able to truly heal. As she speaks, Victor's face moves ever so slightly out of the shadow. I think it's so cool to see Diana and Bruce testifying in this way. In reality, our stories are one of the most powerful things we have, and the testimony of a Christian, their life story and how God has worked in it and transformed it, and what Christ has done for us, is one of the best ways a Christian can share their story of hope with the world. Diana knows that there is a better way than what Victor is doing, because she's been in a similar spot dealt with a similar darkness, and she's experienced healing. Her story connects her to him, and can help him realize that hope is also available for him. She takes steps toward him and he backs away. She comments that if he weren't willing to open up or consider her request, then why would he come and meet with her and listen to what she has to say at all? His cyborg eye darts all about as his emotions race, and what I think he's doing is trying to justify himself in his head. I believe that there is an internal war waging within him in this moment, between the part of him desperate for true life and hope, and the part of him that has tried to shut down any glimmer of that possibility. He blasts off and fires away, running from the conflict and full of emotional turmoil. Diana looks troubled as she surely wonders if she said the right thing, or if she really did what she was supposed to do, wondering if Victor will ever come back or fight with them. Victor, in his broken state, goes to visit his mom's grave and his own grave. He digs his own grave with his bare hands and hides the mother box inside. My mind races with possibilities for his motivations here. The box isn't safe and hiding it gets it out of his hands. He may hate it for what it did to him. He may be trying to protect his father from danger by hiding the box. He may have been drawn to the thought of the graves and his mother after being filled with pain and emotion following his conversation with Diana. I think before he begins to dig, the look on his face begins to emote for nearly the first time since his conversion to being cyborg. He is normally detached and cold or a bitter and angry in a stone-faced way, but his emotional balance has been tipped. He is almost unable to suppress all the feelings as he looks on his own grave in the grave of his mother. 
Digging next to that tombstone with his own hands in the shadow with the gleam of the moon is a powerful image. Next, we cut to Silas and Choi in Star Labs in a really short moment. It involves Choi's most memorable line, a pun about his prom date, and it shows what will happen when alien tech is hit with the electron laser, giving Silas knowledge that he will use later. Choi also asks Silas a question, whether he thinks Batman has any involvement with the box. Especially being in Gotham City, I think it's cool that people like Choi are aware of the existence of the Batman. Silas goes home and sees how Victor has destroyed his tape and left a wreck of his old possessions, balls, and trophies strewn about in his rage. He is then suspensefully cornered by a parademon who slowly comes into view. We then cut to Gotham and get the payoff from the sketch of the parademon in Star Labs earlier, which looks suspiciously like Batman. I love the look of the Gotham Police Department and how it feels like it belongs in the timeless era of Batman the Animated Series. It has an atmosphere that evokes brown-coated detectives and noir more than our slick modern world. This is our first real look at J.K. Simmons' portrayal of Jim Gordon, and I honestly think he is great. His mustache is solid, he looks like he walks straight out of a comic book, and I love his somewhat caustic but insightful commentary. He captures the tough but good-natured cop that is Commissioner Gordon, and I love how this scene ends with the obvious tease that we are going to see the bat signal in action. Despite the more grounded tone of Snyder's DC Universe and its idea of gods walking among us, Justice League, in its return to fantasy, is slowly reconstructing comic booky elements like the Bat Signal back into the narrative. The Bat Signal is perhaps a silly comic booky thing, but it's lovable and it's iconic, and it's cool to see it get brought back. If BVS is an epic deconstruction of these characters in this world, then Justice League is a reconstruction, as Snyder himself has said. And part of that reconstruction involves returning the characters to the core of their comic book roots, as opposed to divulging from them and dissecting them. Silas is escorted to be held with the other prisoners, and if you look real close, you can see Howard the Janitor is still alive for now as well. Our current three Justice League members all meet up next. Barry continues to light up every scene he is in and to make me laugh with nearly every line. His awkwardness introducing himself to Diana achieves the idea of his nervousness being around such a beautiful woman without objectifying her in any way, and her genuine heart can be shown by her warmth and her belief that Cyborg will come around given time. We then see the bat signal in all of its glory, which is awesome to finally see. Barry is like a kid at a candy store while Bruce kind of smiles. I think the youthful energy of Barry brings out a side of Bruce that we never got to see in BVS. He may be mostly self-serious, but he gets to be a little self-aware of his character in a positive way here. BVS is meta about the character of Batman and the way that it pushes what we accept as a proper Batman to the brink. It puts the character in jeopardy and then restores him. In Justice League, we have Barry enthusiastically fanboy over the Bat Signal and Batarangs and all the classic wonderful Batman things that we love, and we are able to have Batman himself be a bit self-aware about how seriously cool and silly some of these things are. Aquaman mocks Batman for his costume, how he dresses like a bat, and Barry questions how he doesn't have any powers except for money. And these are long spoken of comical critiques of the character that this Bruce kind of self embraces and goes along with, which is really neat. We return to Atlantis and find the Mother Box stirring, inevitably drawing the attention of our villains. We are told that Mira is a commander, and she creates a bubble to speak with one of her soldiers. He is reporting back that Orm will not send any guards for the Mother Box because they are all busy in the Rebel regions, meaning that they are contributing to his effort to stoke the flames of war. This is similar to what we learned with Volko, but in the case of Mira, Orm's inaction means that she has to take matters into her own hands, and she takes personal responsibility for the matter. I like how after Steppenwolf's boom tube appears and disappears, a flurry of bubbles remain where it was projected. Steppenwolf flies onto the screen head first in another shot that looks like it belongs in 3D IMAX, with his head flying inches from your nose. He effortlessly dispatches Atlantean soldiers and their blood darkens the water. I like the hints of sci-fi within Atlantis that we get here with the Atlantean blaster guns that will evolve into a full sci-fi fantasy aesthetic within the Aquaman film. I think this is the most brutal Steppenwolf has been so far. With the Amazons, he was fighting against a large number, and the main feature of that sequence is the chase. Here, he is less stoic and more rageful. He bares his teeth and yells and slices Atlanteans in half with ferocity. 
We don't know barely anything about Mira at this point in the story, but we know she is on the side of Atlantis and protecting the box, unlike King Orm, and we get to see here that her powers are intense and awesome. She puts up a fight with Steppenwolf as she creates huge air bubbles and literally sucks the life from his face by taking the water from his body. Blood and water is sucked away in a brutal but really unique conflict. Mira says that she isn't trying to escape before doing this, which suggests that she would rather kill Steppenwolf and save the box than spare her own life, which speaks to her character as well. Ultimately, she is tossed aside and is almost executed before Arthur steps in to save the day. Triumphant Brass accompany the arrival of the king to protect his kingdom, finally willing to take up his charge. This is the first time one of our core heroes has fought Steppenwolf, and it is the kind of duke out that a superhero fan would be looking for. While watching, I thought, this feels like it could be a map for a fighting game like Injustice. While our hero isn't entirely taken out, Steppenwolf does escape with the box, and we see Mira and Arthur get to talk. Arthur moves to leave when Mira mentions his mother's name, and as she continues to speak, he leaves his arm out of the bubble as a threat that he could still leave at any moment. It is a petty move that is effective visual storytelling of his current demeanor. As we touched on earlier, parentage is extremely important to DC characters. Superman and Batman are both orphans. The Flash is trying to live up to his dad's expectations. Victor's dad is trying to repair his relationship with his son. Arthur is super sensitive about his mom, who he feels has abandoned him when she returned to Atlantis. As I've said many, many times in these videos, this will be further explored in the Aquaman film. However, it is cool to see how the rejection he feels by his mother has contributed to his self-imposed isolation. Victor and Arthur share that feeling of parental rejection and abandonment. Mira tells us of a motherly side to Atlanta that Arthur never knew. She was an orphan herself and Atlanta took her in. Up to this point, we have discussed the dichotomy of Arthur's choice as to accept responsibility or reject it. But here we realize that the decision is really a deeper one to forgive his mother and accept his people, or to hold on to bitterness he holds against a woman who he believes didn't care about him. In my BVS video, I talk a lot about perspectives we form that may not be entirely based in reality from our preconceived notions, our life experiences, and most of all, from our immediate emotional reactions. Here, Arthur's perspective makes sense. His mother's departure caused him to believe he was not wanted enough for her to stay. It casts a certain view of her character. Mira challenges this view as someone who knew her and tells Arthur how she didn't want to leave him, but had to leave him to save him. That in fact, Arthur was not the only one in pain, it hurt Atlanta to leave as well. She sacrificed a relationship with her son to save his life, which was a great cost on her as a mother. I like the sternness on Mira's face and the sincerity of which she delivers this news to Arthur. She doesn't sugarcoat anything for him. Arthur remains conflicted as he scoffs and exits the scene. The scene employs some low-key or high-contrast lighting, in which harsh shadows are cast on the actors' faces, and it looks great. Half of their faces are almost completely obscured in shadow, like they are in an underwater cavern. And I think the half-lit, half-shadowed look on Arthur could even evoke the two sides of him that are currently warring inside. Cyborg comes home and discovers his dad's glasses, coming to the realization that his dad has been taken. He looks out his shattered window and up at the sky where he sees the bat signal. Once again, we are reminded that our heroes are in the same world and working alongside each other at the same time. We saw Gordon decide to turn on the signal, we saw Flash and Bruce and Diana notice it, and now Victor sees it too, because he's also in Gotham. In addition, this is the indication to the audience that Victor has decided to join Bruce and Diana's cause, and to find Batman, because now his father is in danger. His words alone would lead us to believe that he has no interest in helping the team, or that he cares about Silas, but the reality is that he cared so much about his father that it hurt him to have his father not return that love in a way that made Victor feel loved. He hadn't received his father's time, and hadn't been affirmed by his father for his achievements. He seems to hate him for bringing him back to life and losing his mother, who he clearly had a strong relationship with. But he loves his father, and with his father missing he is willing to do anything to get him back, including join a team to save a world that he had previously cursed as not worth saving. The League is finally coming together. 
To end part three, we have a moment similar to the end of part one. While our heroes are dealing with internal strife, finding themselves and each other, and making their preparations, Steppenwolf has successfully kidnapped many innocent lives, locked in the second awakened mother box of three, and in doing so created a giant shield barrier around his nuclear hideout. He is two steps ahead of our heroes and shows no signs of stopping and no signs of mercy. Steppenwolf swears that he will find the third box and interrogate the prisoners by any violent means necessary. Part 3 is the longest section so far, and it achieves a lot for the story. It introduces two brand new characters to the DCEU in The Flash and Cyborg, and it captures their wants, their needs, and their backstories as characters pretty effectively as well. By the end of the section, the League has been recruited, and they are now prepared to unite at last in Part 4. With the recruiting out of the way, we now enter what I suppose is, in the big picture, the movie's second act. Act 1 went from our introduction to the setting and world state, to the introduction, development, and recruitment of the League, as well as the rise of Steppenwolf. Act 2 will take on a daring rescue mission, the resurrection of Superman, and the aftermath of that decision. And Act 3 will see Superman coming into a restored form and the epic final fight with Steppenwolf for the fate of the world. If you enjoyed our analysis of Part 3, you definitely won't want to miss the rest, so be sure to subscribe for the rest of the series, like the video if you liked the video, and I'll see you guys next time.